Today we are going to talk about how to effectively interview for a job. You know, your job interview needs to be taken as seriously as anything that you do in your life. You know, a lot of people, they just sign up for interviews and they go and they do the interview and you're missing huge opportunities there because you need to take a job interview as seriously as anything that you've ever done. A job interview could lead you to your best friend. A job interview could lead you to your uh, spouse. Your job interview could lead you to other, opens other doors. You know, when one door opens, other doors open. If one door closes, those doors never appear. So, you know, we want to make sure that we are the ones deciding our fate and not someone else. And so the key to that is understanding and learning how to do job interviewing effectively. So we're going to talk about that today. So as we start, I'm going to play you this little video. It's about a character from Saturday Night Live uh, years ago that was called Stuart Smalley. Take a look at this. I deserve good things. I am entitled to my share of happiness. I refuse to beat myself up. I am an attractive person. I am fun to be with. Daily Affirmation with Stuart Smalley. Stuart Smalley is a caring nurturer, a member of several 12-step programs, but not a licensed therapist. I'm going to do a terrific show today and I'm going to help people because I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me. Now, Stuart was a very wise man because he knew three out of the four things you needed to do in order to have an effective job interview. Number one, I'm good enough. Number two, I'm smart enough. Number three, doggone it, people like me. And number four, I get things done. Those are the four things that you need to be thinking about when you are getting ready for a job interview. How am I going to com communicate those four things? I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, doggone it, people like me, and I get things done. When you go into a job interview, there's really only three questions that an interviewer is seeking to know the answer to. Number one, can you do the job? Well, your resume got you through the door and got you to the point of the resume so they believe that you possess the skills in order to do the job. But you need to reinforce those over the course of the interview. The second is they're going to be trying to measure will you love the job? What is your motivation for wanting to take this job? And third, can we work with you? Are you somebody that, that will fit into our family fit into our work culture well. And so those are the three things that, that an interviewer is trying to evaluate as they ask you questions. And there's a million different types of questions they can ask you, but ultimately at the end of the day, those are the three things that they are trying to assess. Can you do it? Will you love it? And can we put up working with you? Will you fit well into our, our, our team or our culture? I want to share with you now what I call the Broadway show strategy for preparing for a job interview. And the reason I call it the Broadway show strategy is because how you prepare for an interview is much like an actor preparing for a role on Broadway. You know, when we go to the, to the show, we have a big opening number, right? Well, what's your big opening number? for an interview. Well, it's got to be the first impression because before you've ever opened your mouth to say a word, the interviewer will be forming an impression on you from your appearance. So you need to be smiling, you need to look confident, and you need to be approachable. Smiling, confident, approachable, and not cocky. You know, there's a difference between approachable and confident and cocky. And so you, you need to appear to be affable, to, you know, have, a, have a, a good demeanor. And so, you know, as you 
as, as the interviewer comes into the room or you go into the room, you need to make sure that you're communicating that. Because think about an actor. An actor has at their disposal their voice, how they choose to speak. They can talk faster and a little higher pitch if they're excited. They can talk a little slower and with a little lower pitch for something serious. They've got their facial expressions. They can raise their eyebrows when they're talking about something amazing and they can lower them when they're focused and serious. They can smile. They can frown. They can use their hands and gesture. They can use their shoulders. You have at your disposal all of those tools to aid in your communication. And so you need to be thinking about how am I going to take advantage of all of these different options to make my communication more effective. So the big opening number, you walk in the door, you're smiling, you're confident, but not cocky, affable, approachable, and you shake hands. How you shake hands is again important. You want to have a firm and not overpowering handshake. I've had some people that have shaken my hand and have come out like, you know, feeling like it broke a couple of bones in me. I've also had people handshake where they feel like a dead fish. You know, you don't want to be either one of those extremes. You want to have a firm handshake. And you want to hold that handshake just a quarter of a second longer than you normally would because you're making eye contact with that interviewer and you want to create a connection. So hold the, the handshake just a fraction of a second longer than you normally would so that you can look them in the eye to help make that connection. All right, once you've had the big opening number, you've shown that you've got some energy, you're smiling, you've, you're looking at confident and affable, you are going to sit down. And sitting down is again where a lot of people make mistakes because they sit in a way that doesn't uh, give them the best advantage. So if you're sitting back in the chair, what energy is that giving off? It's giving off bad energy that you're closed off. You've got your hands crossed across your lap. You're leaning back. You're afraid of them. So sit on the front of the chair. Lean in. By sitting on the front of the chair and leaning in, now your body posture says, I'm excited, I'm ready to be here, I'm focused, I'm ready, I'm, 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 I'm totally focused on you. So you want to make sure you're front of the chair, leaning in, so that when you talk to the, to the interviewer, you, know, you then have your hands free to use as, as assistance in your communication and all that kind of stuff. So now we're going to advance the storyline. And I chose those words carefully because as we advance our storyline, just like in a movie or a play, things unfold over the course of time, right? So we need to plan how we're going to unfold our story and advance our storyline. You know, when we see two actors on a Broadway stage, and Belle is talking to Beast and saying, why are you keeping me in the castle? And, because I just... You must stay. Those lines sound like they're saying them for the very first time, yet they've been rehearsed thousands and thousands of times. That is what you need to do to prepare for an interview. The last thing you should be doing when you get into an interview is think. Thinking is the worst thing that can happen because you end up saying things that you didn't mean to say. So we want to prepare for our interview, just as a Broadway actor does for their play. And so you need to develop three stories. Three stories from your past or present that communicate, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, doggone it, people like me, and I get things done. So. You want to be able to communicate overtly and covertly. So as an example, let me tell you a story that I might have used in an interview years ago. But, you know, as you, as you listen to the story, try to see, am I covering off? 
Am I good enough? Am I smart enough? Doggone it, people like me, I get things done. And one other thing that you should think about, one other thing that you should think about when you are preparing for the interview, don't assume that the interviewer has read your resume very carefully because a lot of times they haven't. You know, there have been times when, you know, I went through the pile of, of resumes originally. I picked out six people I wanted to have, inter I wanted to interview. I gave those to HR. They set up the interviews. I don't think about it again until suddenly the phone rings from the front desk and says, your 10 o'clock interview's here. And I go, oh, oh. And so I'm scrambling to grab the, inter the resume out in a hurry. I glance at it for three seconds and they walk in the door. So you want to make sure that if you've got something really important on your resume, that you bring that out in the course of your stories. So here's, here's the story. So the interview asks, give me a time when you had an idea and you tried to you know, get it moved through the organization. I go, oh gosh, that's a, that's a good one. Um, it reminds me back when I was starting with the jazz. You know, I'd been hired, I was gonna start on Monday, but on the day before, Sunday, I decided to go to the Bees baseball game. They had a home game that day. And so I go down to the ballpark, I'm walking around and I'm looking, it's a beautiful 70 degree sunny day. All these players, most of them have major league experience. And I'm looking around the ballpark and there's like 300 people there. And I'm going, how, how is this? this? It's a beautiful day, there's only 300 people here? And so I walked over and I found Mark, Mark Amicone, the general manager of uh, the bees and you know he and I go way back we used to play baseball against each other in our younger days and I go Mark what's going on and he just shakes his head he goes you know it's you know, we just haven't been drawn very well and that really bothered me so you know I went home that night and I'm, I'm thinking I'm thinking well you know if I was at Procter and Gamble and I was trying to get someone to try my product I would do some kind of a sampling opportunity so how do you sample baseball? So I thought about that overnight, and then Monday morning I go into the first day of work, and at 11 o'clock we have a senior management meeting, and I walked in and I said, okay, I got an idea. You know, the bees, we need to, we need to bolster their attendance. So what if we did a sampling opportunity? You know, and what's, you know, what I mean by that is what P&G, we would set up in stores and we'd hand out samples to get people to try the product. What if we have a week, we have a week homestand coming up here in about two weeks. We take that homestand and instead of, you know, selling tickets and getting 300 people there every night, we open it up to the public. We put Larry Miller on a commercial that says, hey, you know, I'd like you to come down to the ballpark and experience the bees on me. And so he'll get some good PR. It'll maybe give some good spin over to the car dealerships, to the jazz and we use that as an opportunity to sample the bees. And of course, you know, there were some objections. You know, the salespeople were like, well, we've already sold a group for that night. Well, you know, can, can't we give them a different group another night? We'd still let them have that night, but give them another night as well. Yeah, we can do that. What about season ticket holders? Well, you can't have many season ticket holders if you only got 300 people coming to the ballpark, right? Yeah, well, why don't we give them each, you know, five tickets, uh, that they can give away to some of their families and friends to, to come to the ballpark with them. Okay, yeah, that, that should probably take care of that. So we handled the problems, and then we sat down and ran the numbers and said, okay, so if we were to uh, you know, give away those tickets rather than sell them, what's our lost revenue? And we, just, we figured that over the course of that week, we would have lost about maybe $30,000 in ticket revenue. But by putting 15,000 people in the ballpark every night who on average spend about seven or eight dollars per person on food and beverage, you know, our margin on food and beverage at a ballpark is pretty high. You know, we, we ran all the numbers and we basically decided that over the course of the week, we would lose about $30,000 in ticket revenue, but we would gain about a half million dollars in food and beverage. So clearly seemed like a, a good idea. So we did it. But instead of just opening up the gates and saying, come on in, we used it as an opportunity to build a database for the bees because they had no database. So other than the 300 season ticket holders. 
So we went through and we made them go to the website and they had to fill out a form. This had their family, all their family members' names, their ages, their birthdays, uh, you know, what Major League Baseball teams they liked. So now we've got a database where we can market to them. You know, we can send a kid an email for their birthday, a free ticket, in the, you know, to, to come to the ballpark for their birthday. We know what major league teams they're interested in, so we can promote them when that, that team's coming in. Anyway, long story short, we opened up the ballpark for a week. We put in 15,000 people a night, every night, for seven consecutive days. And we never had a crowd of less than 5,000 people for the next three years to any home game. So it seemed to work. All right. Now, analyze that. Did I say I'm good enough? Yes, I'm smart enough. Yes, doggone it, people like me. Did I work through the problems? Yes. Do I, did I get things done? Yes. Now, what didn't I have to say there? Well, initiative. You know, I went to the ballpark and started this process before I was even on the payroll. If you see somebody that has BYU on their resume twice, you might be concerned about Sundays, right? Well, what day did I go to the ballpark? I went to the ballpark on Sunday. If you're going to work in sports, you have to kind of work on Sundays. It's just the way the business runs. So I, I tried to get rid of some of those concerns that they might have and address all of the main points. I'm good enough. I'm smart enough. Doggone it, people like me. I get things done. I take initiative. And I also was able to notice how I dropped in Procter & Gamble twice in that story to kind of reinforce that, you know, I've got classic marketing experience from Procter & Gamble. That's what we want to do. We want to be able to develop three stories from your past that show that you took initiative, that you got things done, that you have some kind of a quantifiable result for and that you know, shows that you know, you're, you're rip-roaring ready to go and you're, you're going to hit the ground running. Now, I know that's hard sometimes. A lot of you don't have a lot of work experience at all. So you've know, you got to leverage things that you've done at school. You know, I worked on a case competition. We did, 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 did this. You know, we got to be able to, to leverage the things that we've got, which is why it's so important that you get involved with things outside of just the classroom because some of those things are the things that can develop you, uh, the stories that you need to be able to tell. So, we're selling ourselves, we're finding, we're, we're answering fundamental fit questions. You know, am I going to fit well in the organization? Am I going to work well with people? But you need to beware the trap questions. You know, a lot of times interviewers will load in questions that they want to see if you're going to stumble. And we got to be prepared for those. Be the biggest of which, what's your greatest weakness? Now that's a hard one because you don't want to admit weakness, but at the same time you can't be a little, you, you got to kind of address it. So, you know, I would again come up with a story knowing that that's coming. Prepare your story so that you know how you're going to address it. So, for example, I always try to get rid of that with some humor. So I would look at the interviewer and I'd say, gosh, my biggest problem is I can't shut it off. So you know, I'll be at home watching television at night and a commercial will come on for some poor brand and I'll look at it and I'll look at it and go, wait, what? And I'll grab the remote and then my wife and kids go, oh no, here we go again. And so I hit the remote and I rewind and I look at it again and I go, oh. And then I look at it again and I go, oh. And then I look at it again and I go, oh man, this poor woebegone brand. And then I'll be thinking about it all night long. And I keep a, a notepad in my dresser that I get up, I, I'll, I'll come to the solution for them somewhere in the middle of the night. So I get up and write it down. And then, because I can't go back to sleep until I get it written down, and then, you know, so I've got solutions to brand problems for like 200 brands that I've never worked on in my nightstand. So, you know, I, I didn't admit a weakness at all, um, but I tried to deflect it with humor. You know, another way to deflect it with humor is I just can't dance. 
you know, that's another way to try to get rid of it in a shorter way. And, you know, you, they're not going to ask it twice. So, you know, just figure out a way to sidestep that question because we don't want to admit weaknesses. You know, I've had some doozies admitted to me over the years, and that's why I'm telling you this. I mean, I had one girl look at me and say, well, you know, I suffer from migraine headaches a lot that knock me out for like a week at a time. Okay, thank you very much for sharing that with me. You know, I had another guy that said, you know, I love to party hardy on weekends and, uh, you know, getting up and getting to work on Monday mornings is sometimes a problem for me. Really? You just said that to me? Thank you very much. So, you know, don't bring up personal issues. You know, it's illegal for someone to ask you about your marital status, about your health status. They can't ask that. So don't bring it up. It's kind of like in court. If you bring it up, well, it's on the table now. But it's illegal for them to ask, so do not bring it up. If you're going through a divorce, if you're going through some kind of personal health problem, don't raise that because all it can do is hurt you. It cannot help you. So keep those things in the back of your pocket. You know, I've had people walk in and say, well, I'm going through a divorce and, you know, child care is going to be an issue for me. Um, you know, is it okay if I, like, work from home three, to, three days a week? No, we talked about that in the job interview. It's, this is an in-person job. So, you know, you, you got to make sure that you don't open up those Pandora boxes. You know, keep them private. Keep them on your own. Now, questions. Most of the time at the end of the interview, the interviewer will say, well, what questions have you got for me? And then you have to come up with some questions. Now, we're going to play a little game. Remember that Disney movie, Inside Out, where you could kind of see what was going on in the kid's brain? Well, I'm going to play Inside Out here for how to give you an insight into my brain if someone tells me that they have no questions. So, have you got any questions for me? The respondent says, no, no, I think I'm good. What? What? You had no questions for me? You want to come to work? You want to spend 40 hours a week with me spending up to, You had no questions for me? You don't know if I'm a serial killer. You don't know if I'm a psychopath. You had no questions for me? That's <laughs> to the extreme. But that's what goes through my mind because, you know, you've got to have some questions. You need to have some questions prepared that you can ask at the end of the interview. One of them should be related to the state of the business. So you've done your research. So get on the internet, get on Google. Google has this thing called Google Alerts that you can go and you can set up, you can type in the name of the company and it will send you an alert every time something about that company gets posted to the internet. So you can have current information. And it doesn't have to be something that even the interviewer knows the answer to. You know, as long as it can indicate that you've done your research and you're paying attention. So, for example, if you were interviewing with Disney and the question you had was, well, you know, in the changeover from Bob Chapek to Bob Iger, uh, do you anticipate any cutbacks in the division that, we're, that I'm interviewing for? You know, that's a legitimate question. So, you know, have a question or two related to the current state of the business. It's okay to ask the interviewer, well, how long have you been with, Dis with, with the company? And, you know, what's been your experience to get them talking about themselves? Because, again, we're trying to make connections. And so, uh, you know, have one, two, or three questions prepared that you can ask. All right. Now we need to have the big finish. And by the big finish, I mean we don't, we, we want to close like a salesperson. You know, if you take a sales class, they teach you close the sale. Don't just leave it open-ended, right? You want it to be a closer. And in an interview, you also want to be a closer. So how do you close? Now, I'm going to give you this example, and you are free to use it uh, liberally, and it works. You know, I, every semester, I get students that send me emails after this lecture that go, you know, I used, I had an interview, I used it, I got the offer, and, you know, thank you. And, and so, you know, I had one couple of years ago that said, 
So I, I, I had three interviews coming up in the following week. I got offers from all three. Now that's a good problem to have, right? We want to have, be able to choose our own destiny, not have destiny choose for us. So as we prepare our big finish, this is how you do it. So the interview is wrapping up. This is how it sometimes goes. Well, thank you very much for, for having me. And the interviewer says, thank you, and you get up and you shake hands and you leave. That's not closing. That's wimping out. This is how you close. You know, it, as, as we're wrapping up here, I just want to say thank you for having me in because, you know, I've, I've, I've been looking forward to this. I've really been anticipating it. You know, I think I'd be great at this job. And, you know, I just want to leave you with one thought. If you let Eric Schultz through the door, I will knock down walls for you. You'll never regret the day that you hired me. Thanks, and, you know, let's move on to next steps. Now, what you should be doing in your head as you finish saying that is doing a little touchdown dance because you just killed it. Because here's something else you don't know. Oftentimes in an interviewing process, it's a tie. When I get through interviewing people, it's a tie. But if one of them leaned into me and said, I will knock down walls for you, you'll never regret the day that you let me through the door, that just might be enough to tilt the table in their favor. Now, also when there's a tie, here's something else you need to know. When there's a tie, oftentimes the interviewer will ask other people, you know, did you have an interaction with this person? You know, even, even to the extent of the receptionist sitting in the lobby that was chatting with the person before they came back to the interview. You know, there were many occasions in my time at Coke when I was hiring that my administrative assistant really made the decision because I, I was in a tie and I'd walk out to her and I'd say, what did you think? And if one of them was sitting playing with their phone and the other was engaging in a conversation, you know, she'd pick the one with the conversation every time. Leave your phones in the car. It can do you no good. You're not going to be looking up things. You're not going to be answering emails during the day. Leave the phone in the car so it's not a temptation to even pull it out. Because that thing can screw you up more than anything. You want to be completely 100% focused on the interview and on talking and engaging with people when you're in the building. So make sure that the phone is not there as, a, as, a, as something that can distract you. You want to be 100% focused. All right, so we've tried to close, and now it's after the interview. And this is really important. Send a handwritten thank you note. Do not send an email. Emails are cheap and easy. A handwritten thank you note shows a little bit of class. So when you are done with the interview, if you're going to the airport or you're going back home, just have a stack of, go buy yourself a stack of thank you notes and then just write a thank you note to everybody that you interacted with that day. The, anybody that you interviewed with, obviously. Even if someone picked you up at the airport or took you to lunch, or if you sat out in a, in a uh, waiting room engaging with an administrative assistant, everybody that you engage with should get a card to say thank you for, for your time that day. Because here's what else happens. Oftentimes the decision is delayed by a week or two. You know, I've still got somebody else to interview. It takes a little time to get them in. We want to stay top of mind. If, someone's, if you send an email, the email is going to get deleted. If you send a card, the card is likely going to stay laying on their desk for a few days while they're still making the decision. And you want that to be your card and not somebody else. So send a handwritten note. It's okay to ask follow-up. So, you know, when do you plan on making the decision? And if they say, well, it's going to take, you know, a couple more weeks, we've still got some more people to interview, don't give up the faith. Keep the faith for a while. You know, if, it's, if they say it's going to take a couple weeks, just say, well, it, would it be okay if I check back with you in a couple weeks? And they'll say, yeah, sure. And so, you know, if it drags on for more than a month, then it's probably out of, out of business. But 
you know, keep the faith for a couple weeks because especially around early beginning of the year, around holiday periods, around summertime, it's hard to get everybody in the room together um, if there's multiple players that have to be involved in the decision process to get everybody together to make the decision. So, so keep the faith. All right, now, only interview for jobs for which you're going to have a passion and a love. You know, if you're not going to love it, don't interview for it because you might be able to fake the, the passion and the love at the beginning, but it's, over time it will show through and you'll be miserable. No matter what job you have in life, your success will be determined 5% by academic credentials, 15% by professional experience, and 80% by communication skill. 80% by communication skill, which is why I'm taking the time to talk about this today. This is your oral presentation. We've already learned about written presentation through the P&G one-page memo. And so, you know, if you, if you can learn how to do this right, you know, you're setting yourself up for a pretty good ride. And so that's the key here. One last thing, I want to talk about executive recruiters. Because, you know, a lot of times you don't even know about them until it's, you know, they're on top of you. I had no idea that executive recruiters even existed. When I get to P&G, second day on the job, I get a phone call. Hey, this is Blutch and Blutch from executive blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I just wanted to get on your radar. Let's, I'm like, how did you even get my phone number, number one? Because I don't even know what my phone extension is yet. And two, why are you offering me a job where you don't have any idea who I am? Well, you know, these executive recruiters, they get paid by companies to basically be an extended HR team to go out and find the right candidates. And so, you know, they're tapped into companies and they, they talk to people in the industry and they try to figure out, you know, who might be available because, you know, they're, they're looking for fresh meat to be able to serve up to their clients. So you want to be really nice to executive recruiters because you never know, you know, when one might come in handy, when you might decide that you wanted to go change something else. If you've got a stack of executive recruiters in your Rolodex, then that's a pretty good start to be able to help you get another job. Because as you move through your career, the, you know, the mid-level jobs a lot of times are filled through the executive recruiting network. They're not filled uh, through job postings on the internet. And so you want to be very friendly with executive recruiters and get yourself a Rolodex. You know, take them to lunch. Go to lunch with them. Uh, you know, engage in conversations with them. You know, I had one lady that was an executive recruiter out of New York that had contacted me as early as, as, as you know, a month into P&G. But, you know, she didn't hound me to see if I wanted another job. She just checked in once a month or so, just to see how I'm doing, see how I'm adjusting to Cincinnati, see if I've, you know, how is my personal life? She was like my little Jewish grandmother, I called her. Her name was Ann Freed, and she was amazing. And when I'd get up to New York, we'd go to lunch, and when it came time that I wanted to leave Procter & Gamble, you know, I, she was the first one that I called. I said, you know, Ann, I'm thinking about maybe leaving now, um, you know, I think I've, I've run my course here. I, I've, I've got other things to learn. And she said, well, where would you like to work? And I said, well, I think I'd like to go to Disney if that was possible. And within three days, she had me lined up for a job interview down at Disney. And so, you know, these executive recruiters could be a great, great resource for you, especially through mid-career. So you want to be very, very friendly to executive recruiters. They don't cost you anything. They get paid by the company. And so, you know, they're, they're not taking a slice out of your pay. So, you know, you get them for free. So you should really, you know, leverage the executive recruiter as well. All right, so that's how you kill it in a job interview. And good luck.